So we're from uh, Prospectus, um, and we're here to talk to you about how to uh, recruit top digital talent. Um, uh, my name's Andy. I head up the advertising team at Prospectus. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, um, Prospectus works solely in what we call the beyond profit sector. So that's charities, uh, social enterprises, higher education, and we recruit everything from some of the more junior roles uh, through to CEOs, um, uh, trustee roles as well. Um, we place around sort of uh, four to 500 people every year. Um, we've been around for about 60 years. Um, Tristan and I haven't. Um, and also, for anyone that can see, it also looks like we're wearing a uniform today, which isn't actually, we worked together for too long, that wasn't planned. Fantastic, yes. So um, I've been at Prospectus seven years, and I lead a team of eight consultants that work in partnership with the sector to uh, support them finding the right talent up to head of level. And although we've dabbled in digital over the years, the last 18 months to two years, we've recognised the importance that digital transformation is having on the way charities work and how they deliver their services and their impact, more importantly. So I've kind of become an expert in that space, um, working to support organisations, identify which part of the digital journey they're on and find them the right people at the time. So we're just going to give you an overview of how today's going to kind of run. First off, we're going to give you some context on charity digital skills at the moment, looking at some uh, current research. We won't labour the point because we've, you probably might be aware already about the current trends in digital. Um, then we're going to introduce the digital jobs landscape at the moment, what it looks like, some of the demographics and who's actually in these positions at the moment. Thirdly, we're going to show the distilled learning and advice that we can give from all the work that we do in the sector that's going to hopefully um, show you some pitfalls and show you the opportunities about going through recruitment for digital talent. And for the, the best thing of today, which a lot of the conversation will be based upon, is a kind of robust strategy for acquiring those uh, hard to fill digital talent positions. Um, we'll spend about half the talk on that. Yeah. I think what I'd say is everything's going to be applicable. So if you're a small organisation or a large, uh, sorry, large organisation, um, the idea is there should hopefully be some takeaways already lost one, sadly. Um, hopefully there'll be some, uh, some takeaways, uh, no matter what scale of organisation you are, that you can apply to your recruitment strategy. Um, so firstly, uh, so the need for skills. Um, so anyone that's come across the charity digital, uh, digital skills report, it's really, really interesting, um, produced by a skills platform and Zoe Amar, I believe. Um, and there's various statistics in there. Some of the ones that we help frame the context for what we're going to talk to you about today. Um, is obviously charity see digital um, is really a key opportunity in terms of strategy and um, that could be beneficiaries could be fundraising it could be marketing um, and um, it's in uh, what the interesting point is that charities only 29 percent are confident in their ability to innovate and create digital products and uh, the angle that we're coming um, at this today is from uh, the actual lack of digital skills so we're hoping that you're here because you're interested in digital and you want to learn a little bit more about how you can acquire um, sort of these skills if you are the 43% that are struggling to find them, 57% that are struggling to find them, 43% are doing it well apparently. So Andy and I were putting our heads together. Um, strangely enough, we decided that the shape that best represents the digital jobs market and representing the skill spectrum that's there is a Star Wars destroyer. An Imperial Star Destroyer. Right, right. So, sorry about that, an, imp an imperial star destroyer and um, at the thick end there that represents the kind of majority of the market um, where there's a little, you know, there's the minor, um, a minimal amount of digital coherency that's required for any job now as they were just talking in that session there. So we're looking at kind of database administrators, reception, accounts assistants, they're all going to be digitally savvy to a, a point. Then at the right end of the, the star destroyer uh, digital, uh, the Imperial. Imperial Star Destroyer, my apologies. We rehearse again. this, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to be looking at the, the end that's going to have an exceptionally high level of digital coherency. So web developers um, within a web development agency or a senior technical architect in Salesforce, for example. And the conversation is going to primarily focus on the harder to reach positions, but it's applicable throughout, to be honest. Um, and although needless to say, at this end, the, there is a candidate short market, as we call it, as in there are fewer candidates um, to actually, well, to get on board into your organisation. So, the, yeah, this end is where we're going to show our learning for you guys. 
Um, and so we think it's really important to talk about diversity as well, actually. So um, we've talked about the, uh, the jobs market and the diversity of the digital jobs market. Um, these are some stats taken from um, a website called Tech Nation. Um, so it's from Adzuna, which is a job board um, coupled with the, um, some ONS data. Um, does anyone want to have a guess for every 100 people working in a digital tech job in 2017, 2018 data is to be released, how many were women? Any guesses? 20? Two. Uh, in the UK? 40? It's 19%. Someone said 20. We don't have any prizes, actually, as an off-talk. That would have been a good idea. Um, in actual fact, the, the UK average is 49% across all jobs. Um, so what this tells us, and it's probably unsurprising if you read anything in the press, to be honest, around tech companies, um, is that women are underrepresented um, in the workforce at the moment. Um, you can see where this is going. Um, so same question again um, around uh, BAME candidates. Any guesses? 15? Uh, 30? 15 is really annoying because you got it right on the nose, actually. <laughs> um, what, is, what I found really interesting doing this research, actually, that is in the UK jobs market, I've triple-checked this a couple of times as well because I almost didn't believe it, um, is that um, uh, BAME candidates represent 10% um, across the UK workforce, and that's from ONS data. Um, so what this tells us is that um, candidates from a BAME background are actually overrepresented um, in the jobs market, obviously not reflective um, of the UK population as a whole. Um, and finally, um, the whole under 35 uh, millennial market. Anyone want to have a guess uh, about the uh, percentages of people that are under 35 working in digital tech jobs? 65, 75? 28%. So the idea that um, everyone's sort of snapchatting, snapchatting their way into jobs um, isn't really reflective of the, the wider market. Um, across the whole of the UK, it's 29%. So actually, um, those working under 30, uh, sorry, people under 35 is actually on par in terms of digital tech jobs and the wider UK um, jobs market. Tristan and I are just limboing under that 35 at the moment. Tristan's only got a week left, actually. Yeah, um, and, yeah, so we just think it's really interesting, actually, just to understand a little bit of that candidate base. Fun fact for you, because I think every presentation should have a fun fact. Where in, and I'll be generous, in London, are there more people under 35 working in digital tech? Only place in, um, in the UK. Exactly, Silicon Roundabout. Everyone gets that. I thought that would be really tough, but never mind. Um, so that just tells you a little bit about the actual candidate base that you're working with. So when you're going to recruit for roles, don't presume that everyone's going to be just graduated from university and is an expert on Facebook is going to be good for your job. I'm sure you're not thinking that anyway. But I think it's really important to be mindful of what the actual candidate base looks like. Great. So this is the kind of distilled information from lots of recruitment drives and what has maybe got in the way of a successful placement for an organisation and what they've kind of feedback from both the candidate and client on what has let them maybe pick another option as opposed to the, your organisation. So the first one is quite obvious, it is the compensation and benefits. You are competing in a multi-market environment for some of this talent. So it's going to have to be, you have to be compensating these staff as best you possibly can. Um, obviously I understand the budgets are tighter in the charity sector. I'll give you some other ideas on how to offset that later. But essentially that's the big big driver. If you're looking at just an extreme end, as I said, on this Imperial Star Destroyer, the, the this, uh, Salesforce technical architect is looking at a salary of 120, 140k in the commercial sector. We had it with a startup. They could offer 80. They were unable to place because of the massive difference. Um, the second part, or just on one more point on that, is the other aspect of benefits. Be, be, be more flexible around working posture for staff in this space. Do anything you possibly can to offset the fact that you can't pay on par with maybe the commercial sector. Secondly is digital attractiveness and we're going to explore this a lot later under brand but essentially you know you want to show to your the, the, the candidate base out there that you are digitally savvy and there's more behind the job than just that's digital for you. You need to be just demonstrating the kind of digital maturity we call it of your organisation which means your dispersed digital content in your organisation. So does your receptionist speak digitally? Does your HR team engage on a digital basis? Or is it very isolated pockets of people that are talking around that information? And um, 
There's a statistic earlier that we've discussed before was 84% of new um, job seekers want to work for a digitally progressive organisation. So it has to be there now. And that's from the charity digital skills report as well, so that's sector specific. Yeah. Um, and an environment of learning and failure and the excitement about new products kind of tied together. These candidates want to work in organisations that reflect how they work and how technology and innovation occur. So environments that are risk averse won't be as successful. Um, risk averse organisations will be successful. Those that are scared of risk won't be effectively. And excitement about new products, you want to bring them in to do something. The status quo, we, for example, with database and CRM positions that we place a fair bit of, the challenges of getting really the talent that organisations really want, they don't want to do the status quo and maintain the existing database. They want to use data for your organisation and really develop it so it has impact. From the client side, this is the bit that's both an opportunity that you can utilise much better, in my opinion, from my exposure to the sector, is your values proposition. This is the bit that offsets you to the commercial sector. Not everybody is motivated just by money. They want to see the impact of what they're doing. So coming back to that data point, if you can get the data CRM Salesforce professional to say the way you utilise data will benefit your service users and you can show tangible outcomes, it does offset the salary. It does, and it's proven to happen again and again. But you need to arc, um, articulate that values proposition and we're going to help you with that in a bit. Simply advertising in the wrong places. Two-dimensional recruitment strategies don't work. So we're going to give you some exciting quick wins on that front as well. As I've mentioned, it's a multi-market situation. You're competing with, you know, for data, for example, you're competing with the city in London, for example. Um, and digital maturity, again, think about how your organisation looks externally. It's a two-way engagement. They will be, um, be um, performing significant scrutiny on your organisation to see if you actually walk the walk around digital. So be aware of that as well. Okay, so fantastic. So we're just going to spring them up down and just talk about this recruitment strategy over the top. It does look a little bit like a marketing cycle, um, but we find it works really well for engaging, attracting, nurturing and converting uh, candidates to your brand. And eventually the key at the end of the game is to get them on board and working for your organisation in a long-term position. We're not just talking about short-term gains. We want them to commit to your organisation. So the first is attracting, very simply engaging active candidates who are looking in the job market, but also anyone who's in that space just to see that you are digitally savvy. The more complex piece is around nurturing, and we're going to go into depth around kind of cultivating a positive digital image there. And then the third is getting them across the line. There's some really easy do's and don'ts in this space that is, is frustrating as a recruiter, but it's more frustrating for the organisation when we're so close to getting the person that everybody knows is the right fit, but there's some ABC things just don't get done and that candidate goes somewhere else. So we'll talk about that as well. I probably like underline some of that in terms of um, some of our motivations when we're working as well. So at Prospectus, no one works on a commission, base, a commission basis. So everyone pays, is everyone is paid their salary at the end of the month. Um, and our, our sort of frustration with some of those things too isn't about missing out on a commission paycheck. It's about making that connection between a candidate and a client that we think is a really, really good fit um, uh, for them. Um, at the end, that's the end in itself rather than any motivation above that. Just what I deal with that, just in case you think we're worried about our commission running out the door. Um, and so, yeah, so attract. So this is the stuff that you can probably take away and if you do nothing else, it's really simple. Um, and this is dealing with um, uh, turning strangers into visitors. Um, so three things to mention, job boards. Um, social media and agency. Um, by agency, uh, we mean recruitment agency. Um, this is the stuff about how you can engage largely active job seekers. Um, so these are people that are active on job boards, registered for job alerts. Um, they want to move from their current position. And um, what you tend to find is there's different statistics out there. Um, around 10 to 15 percent of your pe uh, potential candidate base are active job seekers. Um, to actually engage some of that other sort of 85% uh, requires um, a little bit more thought, probably a little bit more money, um, and that comes into the nurture side um, that we'll come on to shortly. But in terms of attract, what could you do tomorrow if, if you need to recruit um, a sales source architect or a, a head of digital, or maybe it's even a, a social media marketing office or whatever it is? Um, it's first of all um, looking at the job boards you use. Has everyone heard of Charity Job? It's a really, really good job board. 
Um, it uh, performs really well. We advise our clients to use it a lot. Um, however, it is sector specific. So what Tristan's talked a lot about is the, um, the opportunity to engage candidates from a range of different sectors. Um, everyone in here is going to be potentially fishing in that same pool. Um, there's a lot of competition for the jobs. Um, what can you do to, um, to have a point of difference in a very crowded marketplace that's focused solely on charities? It's probably quite challenging. Um, there's actually a plethora of other job boards in the marketplace. Um, and these are focused on skills rather than sector. Um, so, for example, creative pool um, is, you can probably guess, focused on uh, candidates interested in creative positions. You've got stuff like Stack Overflow, CW Jobs, Techno Jobs, JobServe, uh, JobServe Bubble. And you will find a different set of candidates where you can articulate your point of difference in a much more powerful way by going into some of these different media. Um, they don't need to be expensive either. Um, and I'm really not trying to um, sort of rubbish charity job at all here because they perform really well and they're really good rates and everything but just be mindful of the other places that you can go um, this is quite shameless so apologies I'll probably it's probably the only shameless thing we've got in this so just give me a little bit of a rope is charity digital jobs so this is something that we've partnered with tech trust on actually um, we recognize that we we felt there was a bit of a, um, uh, a hole in the market I guess for a job board focused on charities focused on digital skills um, it's, had a, it's only been live for about three months. It's had over 10,000 job views. Um, and this is leveraging the charity digital news audience, which contains a lot of, um, uh, sort of other sectors, not just focused on charities. Um, and it's also it's free to post. Um, other options are available. Um, but the, that entry price is completely free. Um, so that's a place, another place for you to go to to find different talent. Um, I say this is all the different ways that you can go, uh, go back to your office tomorrow and maybe try a new job board and um, see what works for you. Um, secondly, uh, so social media. Um, you've obviously got your organisational channels. Um, it's a great way to enhance your employer brand. Um, in our view, some of the biggest missed opportunities are actually around internal influencers. Um, and has anyone seen out of interest that Netflix Fire documentary? Yeah, I've got like a couple of nods. I recommend everyone to go watch it. For one thing, it's very entertaining. Um, for another, it actually shows the power of influencers. Um, uh, long and short of it, there was this party in the Bahamas that a bunch of, um, I think they described them as overprivileged kids, paid thousands of pounds for, and it completely tanked. Um, but the whole power and momentum behind that was built by social media influencers. Um, how can you maybe leverage um, some of this? So this is, uh, we don't have permission from Julie to this, but I'm pretty sure things are fine. Um, so she is Director of Digital Transformation at Parkinson's UK. And um, you can see she's got, uh, does a lot of tweets, a lot of followers, um, and we've done a little analysis on her profile. And she's very influential in terms of digital, and particularly in the charity sector. Um, at the beginning of this year, she posted a tweet. Um, some incredible jobs going at Young Minds UK. She lists them all. Um, 11 retweets, 10 likes. I think what would be really useful for you to think about in your organisation, who are your internal influencers that can help support your employer brand? And this is um, people tapping into a passive candidate base. So we talked about job boards, active candidates. This is social media where Julie Dodd might have met someone at the last year's charity digital tech conference, um, follows her on Twitter. They see this post up over the weekend. Wow, that looks pretty cool. Let's see what these jobs are about. So who are the people in your organization um, that you can engage with to share and promote um, you as a great place to work in digital? And again, it's free. And there's obviously time associated with it. Um, but it's a really good way to leverage some of your internal resources. Um, other bits around social media as well is if you're posting on your organization channels, usually you're just um, speaking to your own networks. Um, um, if you have someone in marketing or comms, they can tell you about how you can target people on social media based on skills and interests. So with LinkedIn, um, targeting people, digital manager, working in a non-profit. Um, so it's thinking of some of those different routes to market for your jobs. It's a lot of stuff that you'll find marketing and comms are doing already. All you want to do is try and pivot that um, into recruitment. Uh, finally, agency. Um, uh, so again, we mean recruitment here. Who doesn't love talking to recruitment consultants all day? We love it. We work with them. Um, and your, uh, if you have a trusted relationship with a recruitment consultant, and it really doesn't need to be us, they are a wonderful source of information. 
Um, they spend their entire time talking to candidates, talking to clients. Um, if you want to speak to them about benchmarking, um, going to market with a particular job title, um, any trends in the marketplace, whatever it might be, phone them up and speak to them. It could take you 10, 15 minutes of your time and it might actually inform how you're going to market for direct recruitment. Um, if you've got that good relationship, people aren't going to be charging for this. Um, it's just a really uh, a good valuable source for you to go to. It's someone external and, and objective as well. Um, it's a really, really good source. Great. So thanks, Andy. So now we're looking at the slightly longer term game around nurturing talent that isn't actively looking into your organisation as of yet. So as Andy said, 85% of job seekers tend to be, well, as we call them, passive. So they're not poking their head up above the trench yet to look for work. But we need to get your brand and organisation in their mindset for when they do, or at least when they do, they see your, your brand first. So um, kind of what captures their attention in the first instance are your brand management, your events, and your digital reputation. So we're just going to look through those things. So um, to be part of the conversation is key. You know, you want to be demonstrating, probably via your marketing teams and your comms team already, pivoting that content development that they do towards recruitment or having a say in what your organisation does in the right spaces. So you need to find out where the conversations are happening around digital and what your organisation is doing. You know, there's plenty out there. We've mentioned them today, Charity Digital News, Tech Trust. There's conversations going on. Find in your organisation how you can contribute or share your learning or failure into that space and deliver that because that will give your brand, when a job seeker's not even aware that they're job seeking yet, but when they do go to market, they'll correlate your brand recognition with being digitally savvy and having that first step of digital maturity that we're trying to cultivate for you. Um, you know, we've done that internally as well in those last 18 months when we've been trying to immerse ourselves in that space as well. So we've partnered with Shout to Digital News we did some research around fundraisers and the technological advancements in there, such as cryptocurrency, gaming, data usage. Really interesting piece. And the point I want to make is it has nothing to do with recruitment. There's no mention of recruitment in there, but we're sharing our learning in that space. So we're just part of that conversation. There's a variety of mediums and it's about pitching your organisation at the relevant pitch. You know, you're not necessarily Bernardo's going in and talking macro level comms, for example, but asking questions on those forums about the challenges you're facing and building a conversation with another like-minded organisation, that's a start. You know, you're going to be seen in that space. I think it's um, finding an interesting story to tell about your organisation around digital, if that's where you're struggling. So bringing it back, I won't find the beginning slide again, but never mind. Um, so somewhere in here, God, that's a lot of slides, isn't it? Sorry. Um, so bringing it back to something about your, um, it might be an environment of learning from failure, it might be an excitement about a new product. I was sat in the uh, hall a moment ago with someone from a, sort of an SME charity and their board's about to sign off, hopefully, he said, um, on a new digital strategy. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with him about how you then take that to market to actually resource and find the people to deliver that strategy. So it's almost like, what's the hook? Um, so for that organisation, it's about improving services for beneficiaries. And so being able to articulate that um, in the form of a, uh, an interesting article um, will do you a lot of favours. If you go to somewhere like Guardian Jobs, maybe, you'll end up paying um, a bog load of money for it, to be honest. Um, but what are the different networks and uh, communication channels that you can, you can leverage for free to put your brand out there? So if you do have some of those products or services that are going to be launched, that's the hook. That's what people will find really interesting. If you can pay them 100 grand to do it, like that's great. That's like really easy, right? The more challenging stuff is why do they want to work for you? And it's like that excitement, those products, et cetera, that will um, help you tell that story. So, um, yeah, so that's one example. Another one is around advice and guidance, coming back to what we've just been saying. Share your learning with the sector. Show that... Um, risk averse attitude and put it out there and say this is what we did, this was what didn't go well. It shows trust, it shows positivity and it reflects that kind of way of working that uh, candidates like to see fundamentally. So we did a white paper on uh, with the London Community Foundation on what went well, what didn't when they moved from print to digital for their annual report that we supported them with and we put it out there. It got some really interesting feedback and again this is us a couple of degrees removed from what the vital work your organisations do in the sector is. So you're going to have super rich content and super interesting things to say. It's just, as Andy said, pivoting it and getting that out there. 
Another one like today, events. You're sitting next to people that are all in the same space, talking to similar conversations, facing challenges. Do network, do speak to people. It's such a good resource. You never know that what kind of things you might learn, but also they could be your next candidate for when you go to, go to market with a role. So ABC recruitment is just do your follow-ups. You know, go on LinkedIn, say hello, and just get them into your networks. Also, they might be the third degree. They might be able to recommend someone at a later stage. So those are small, small little ABC moments in recruitment, but they can yield such a reward. Uh, these are the ones we've been to this year. A plethora of understanding around digital from all different parts of the sector, from membership through to kind of small grassroots organisations, fundraising. It's really fascinating and just sharing that learning it means that you're more <coughs> equipped as an organisation when that candidate does come to your door, you can talk and show that you understand what you're talking about. So it's the same example with Julie Dodd, like if someone followed her at that event, right? Then you follow them, you see the job. Uh, so this is uh, applicable, I guess, to all forms um, of recruitment, actually. So this is, um, who used Google Maps to get here out of interest? Pretty much everyone, right? So if you, um, if you imagine you're that candidate that might, you might have uh, seen a role on a job board, you might have networked with someone at an event, whatever it is, and then you're going to your interview, um, one of the things that we think is really powerful to do is how you can enhance your reputation digitally. Um, I think you'll probably find that marketing or comms, whoever it is, has a, has a handle on some of this already, but if they don't speak to them, so if you're a candidate coming to interview, um, at someone's offices, when you're on Google Maps and you see, it's inevitable, right? Who, I never want to go on Google and I book a restaurant. If I see it's got one star, it's really bad, almost like I don't want to go there. I'm looking at the four or five stars, which might be crapper and they've got better marketing. Um, not that we don't, right? Ours is really good. <laughs> um, and so we spent um, the past 18 months, because we're conscious, we see a lot of candidates coming to our offices. We want to make sure that we're getting um, an authentic feedback from our candidates um, to reinforce what we hope is a good reputation. Um, and you can see there's sort of 4.6 and just people writing down how great it is to, to come and uh, work with prospectus and all that stuff is fantastic. Um, and what are the things that you can do, be it standalone or be it with your marketing team, to make sure that you're picking up and ticking all these different boxes? It's trying to create a, create a seamless journey across all your different digital channels. I think just on that, Andy, one of the things that when we instigated that process around improving our digital reputation was we had a very good face-to-face -face network reputation in the sector. We've been going for 60 years, really well established. People know of us and everyone used to say, oh, I used to get my first job through Perspectives, so I know of you. And then we realised that online we were at 3.2 or something and we rec it was such a simple ask. Instead of just at the end, we just had to change everyone's mindset in the organisation, may, may showing that digital maturity, I guess, to ask people, could you just put it online? You know, do if you get time, put it online. And it just works. That's a good, uh, good uh, song, actually. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we've got, we're getting there, right? So we've got the, a huge amount of time has been invested and effort. You've got the content. Everyone that you, in that space understands that you're digitally savvy. Now we're getting to the point where you want to get that candidate across the line. Okay, so simple things. These are kind of do, just do, do's and don'ts. So CV and application form, forget application forms. You've got you've, multi-market approach, candidates, it's candidate short market. They come through and you say, right, now I want to uh, see what you can do. Here's an application form. They're, between them and another candidate, um, another client, they're going to go for the smoother, seamless process. They're digital candidates. They're efficient. They're time poor. You need to help them on that journey. Second is access to hiring managers. If you need to hire someone, you need to have that conversation with the relevant person in your organisation. Sometimes HR isn't equipped to have those techni uh, technical conversations, demonstrate understanding, show that digital attractiveness. So access to hiring managers is key, in our opinion, to firstly understand the brief, but also engage candidates. Appreciate, again, they're probably quite time poor. So quick wins, involve them in the job description process. Make sure they're asking what they want in the job description so it becomes attractive. Again, length of recruitment process, the amount of times, unfortunately, clients don't get the talent they want and have to go back out to market because they've gone to interview, then they say, oh, we'll do a second interview next week. And you, the market, they're going to be, if they're that sought after, they're not going to be just focusing on one organisation. So you need to be thinking, how do we organise ourselves to be quicker and more fluid? Um, and another key thing is CV and cover letter only go so far. You need to look at portfolios, questioning, testing, 
with what they actually need to develop for you. So it could be a web development test, coding test, something along those lines. I think a really fun one we done actually was when we were recruiting to a marketing role. It was um, a draft, a treat, a draft a tweet about prospectus in 140 characters. Uh, it's something nice and simple that anyone should be able to just, if they're actually going to be working for you in a marketing and comms role, they just should be able to just do that um, with their eyes closed, to be honest. So stuff like that, make it really applicable. It doesn't need to be, show me your Salesforce architecture portfolio. It could be as simple as that. Just make sure you tailor it to the role. Great. Yeah, and we've covered HR and the other points of contact. Everyone is your ambassador with these people from reception through to uh, the CEO. So, and the trustees as well, if it's a senior position. So they need to know, if there's a second interview at trustee level, do equip them to understand what they're talking about. Great. Yeah. <laughs> the trustee one's an interesting one, right? Um, yeah, so really that's sort of what we wanted to uh, put across to you in terms of that journey of attract, nurture and convert. Um, it's a lot of stuff that we've been doing because um, uh, obviously it's important to us in terms of our business as a growing market. Um, so hopefully that's helpful in terms of some uh, different routes that you might be able to try um, for attracting your next role. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. No, 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 sorry. Thank you very much. Cheers.